also any ladies that would like to join Janet, please make your way up front. And the prayers, if you need them, are on the front panel of your program. Oh, by the way, men, we've outnumbered you now. <laughs> and I was one with I four was until ten. Yeah, we went ten of each. Come on, darling. Baruch atah v'nai Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to be a light to the nations and who gave to us Jesus our Messiah, the light of the world. Amen. And now we're going to all stand and face east, which is this world right here on our right. And we're going to sing and recite the Shema together.
everything worships, everything made. Oh, 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 oh,
parents. So. We always appreciate you, Thomas. Fill our spirits with song in our, song in our spirit. How I can't. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for that, but as I said, I usually have a little pathway I can sneak through and not disturb what's going on. And when I saw it was gone, I just thought that's okay. That's okay. I hope you're all blessed. And, uh, we miss those who aren't present with us, but we carry on as if they are because they're here in our hearts with us, are they not? And uh, usually you get Bruce and his little bit of insight into our parasha, but I'll mix that in. And in fact, if you were with me last week, I misspoke just slightly. I thought I had four Shabbats to be working with, and you know, sometimes we get a little mishmash when we're going from our Jewish calendar to our Gregorian calendar, and I really only had three Shabbats. So um, I'm going to bring us in just capping last week. I brought it from our prophet Yermia, Jeremiah. And I said, then I would bring, um, I, I gave you his part. Then this week I was going to give you Yeshaya, Yeshia, who's Isaiah's heart. And then next week I was going to be on Tisha B'Av, with the commemoration that is, and the following week would be God's heart. Tisha B'Av is next Wednesday sundown. So <laughs> I'm combining. I'm going to bring you through the heart of our prophet Isaiah. Really, I'm going to call it the vision of Isaiah, where it was the heart of Yermia. And not that it's not his heart, but he has a vision, and that's why uh, I am saying it in that way. Um, we saw Yermia, his, his message was one of judgment, coming, being carried off into captivity, yet he always held out that hope, and we saw the hope all the way through. And I could almost say it's the very same thing with Yeshiahu, with Isaiah, because his message through the book it definitely is judgment, 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 but it's also hope, hope, hope. He warns our people that, well, and he says the warning's coming from God, that they are a godless people. They're acting as if they have no God. That will only send them into exile. That will only bring them trouble if they do not have a heart for God and do not follow him. Yermia got the privilege of being called doom and gloom. He was the weeping prophet because in his whole heart he was so tender that he, he wept often. We saw Yeshua wept when he looked over Yerushalayim and saw the hearts of the people who were not turned toward God. So we see a, a similarity uh, between the two, but also th that similarity because Yeshiahu, Isaiah, is also going to bring us hope. He's known for Israel's hope, the hope of Israel. And if you're uh, among the religious Jewish people today, they still speak up and look for the hope of Israel. Mm -hmm. And if you really know what they mean, they are really meaning they're hoping for their Messiah to come. Sadly, what they don't realize is Messiah came and he's coming again. That they're looking for that Messiah that's going to set up this kingdom, they're going to have new Israel, they're going to have God's kingdom on earth, and they're going to have the fulfillment of the prophecies that have been given in relation to they as a people, the people of God. Um, and specifically, Yeshua is well known for his predictions of the coming Messiah, his prophecies again and again and again. And he brings up very clearly that he will redeem his people from their sin. So it shouldn't have been so hard for our people to understand and to see and to follow that. That when he wasn't setting up the kingdom and coming as king in all the glory and the pomp and the circumstance of a king, but when he was constantly telling them that he was, he was dealing with the issue of sin, dealing with the issue of rebellion, de dealing with the issue of a heart that needed to be turned back to God. They should have been listening. They should have been catching it. But he, he would often um, 
or Isaiah now would often take the warnings and he would juxtapose them with the hope. So you hear the judgment, but, judgment, but. <laughs> and he continually tried to focus them with what would be uplifting, what would guarantee them their hope, what would bring that kind of prosperity and ultimately their salvation. And that's really what mattered even more than the prosperous times that they wanted to live in. They needed the hope of their salvation, just as we do today. We don't want to have all the riches of this world lavished on us and fear our future. We want to know that our future is secure, that it's going to be a good future. Yeshaya's words carried a conviction, and they carried a discipline, they carried commandments that needed to be obeyed and so he called them out constantly calling them out but he also was very very humble very similar to Yermia again remember last week if you were with me in the very first chapter of the book given by his name because he's the author of it he said I can't speak God he was very young, he was probably around 20, which was younger than a lot of the ones who were called. He felt his youth, he felt like, I don't know what to say, how am I going to, to, to do this? And God told him, fear not, I'll put my words in your mouth. That was verses 6 and 8 through 9 in chapter 1 of Jeremiah. Well, if you look at Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 6, if you start with verse 1, you're going to see that he has this vision that the glory of the Lord is amazing what he sees. And I'll touch on that a bit more. But to get to my point right now, by the time we get down to verse 5, verse 6, one of the two right there, he says, Oh, woe is me of unclean lips. He felt so worthless, so humbled by the beauty and the glory, the majesty and the purity of, of his vision of his Messiah that he felt how filthy and how dirty and how could he speak? What could he say? So both prophets felt very much the same. I think that they could have identified with each other easily and I don't want to confuse you, but I did give them to you in opposite order. Yeshia predates Yermia by about 100 years. But there was a point in doing that because we were following our Haftor portions and they were in Yermia last week and now we're looking at Yeshaya. So I gave you the background on Jeremiah. I gave you the timing and who he was with. And let me do the same for you for our prophet Isaiah. I wanted to preface it by telling you a lot of times the secular world wants to deny our scriptures. They want to say, you know, that's the stories, the fables. You know, why can you say that's so true? And they'll even say, we don't even know if these people really existed. Now, I love, you give archaeology time, and it'll prove the Bible right every time. And in the case of Yeshia, Isaiah, they have found an inscription. It's a seal with the impression, and if they found one for Isaiah, I'll explain it in a moment, and they found one for Hezekiah, both close in, in where they found them, which just happens to fit because Hezekiah was king when Isaiah was prophet. So they're living at the same time. They both would be near the temple because they had work to do at the temple. And that's where the, these inscriptions were found. They were found in an excavation called Ophel, O-P-H-E-L. It's at the foot of the southern wall of the Temple Mount. And we found a lot of artifacts there at the, the, the southern wall. The steps leading in is a very exciting archaeological dig that, like I say, you turn a page, you turn a spade, and you've got, you know, the answer. Now, the inscription for Yeshia, Yeshyahu, specifically, has the name Isaiah, and of course in Hebrew, in, in the ancient Hebrew lettering, and then it has what would be almost the word for prophet. Prophet is Hanavi, and it's missing the, the A letter, even though we don't have the vowels are missing the all of the that would be in that work. Now you've got to realize, I should tell you, he's a prophet in the eighth century. So we've got, you know, we're going back over 700 years BC in, you know, when we're in that eighth century because you have to count down and then we count up. So to think that you would find something preserved absolutely perfectly 
in the ground. <laughs> Come on, folks. <laughs> so if you can read Isaiah, and you can read every letter for the word Hanavi except one letter in the Hebrew, and there's, you know, it, it's obviously um, not a perfect, you know, it, it's worn. It, it's worn. I think that it's not a jump to say originally that read Yeshiahu Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet. They still want to argue it? Right. Okay. Argue till the cows come home. <laughs> we know the word of God is true, and we don't need something found in the dirt to prove to us the word of God. But I did find it very interesting, and, and as I said, right there at the same place, in the same type of clay form that they found, and of course these are broken, is Hezekiah being mentioned as king. And that's just a little too coincidental for me to throw it out because you can't read one of the Hebrew letters that they want you to say that it's got to be there. Putting Yeshiahu Isaiah in this time puts him 700 years before Yeshua walked on this earth. 700 years. Don't miss that. Okay? I can't go back 700 years in my mind. I can't go back 100 years in my mind because I wasn't there. <laughs> How would you like to, in 2023, tell people, put it in writing, What's going to happen in 27, 23? 700 years into the future. And let's not be general. Let's be very specific. Because Yeshua is going to give you details of the life of Yeshua. He's going to give you the way he would be born. He's going to tell you virgin birth. We get that out of Isaiah. But he's not only going to tell you about his birth, he's going to tell you about him. He's going to tell you about his death. He's going to tell you about his burial. He's going to go one step more than just telling you about his resurrection. He's going to tell you about his exaltation. He's going to take us from birth to second coming as king, who will come in the way our people expected the first time and missed out. 700 years prior. And I'm here to tell you every single word he said. You can dot the I's, you can cross the T's, you can put the periods at the end of the sentence. There's nothing off. There's not one detail that is wrong. If there were, then I'll join the group that says we can't trust the word of God. It's not to be believed. Take it at face value. It was written long ago. They did a good job, but... There's no room for that. And if you want the litmus test of proof for me, for Yeshua, Yeshua quoted from his book. And Yeshua called him Yeshua Hanavi. Done. I don't need any more than that. That's proof. But for those who want more, there is so much more that we can look into to see. And as we take every one from the scriptures and we look, I've brought to you before Pontius Pilate. Oh, no, he couldn't be. Someone with a position in the Roman authority, there would be proof outside of the scriptures. And you heard that argument loud and clear. And I believe it was the 1950s when they uncovered the stone that not only had Pontius Pilate's name, but had uh, the uh, Titus, had the, the, the one who was over him. Goodness, I can't think what to call you know, like Caesar Augustus, but it was, you know, oh, goodness, sorry, folks, I'm ruining this, but trust me, it was the name and who was over him, both found on a stone that is on display every day in Caesarea, proving again the word of God. So when I see the scriptures, I can believe them because of the proofs, but especially when I see prophecy, foretelling, 700 years ahead, and he gets it. He nails it. Honestly, I can't tell you seven days from now and nail it. <laughs> but he did. He's often called the greatest evangelist of the original covenant. I, I can see why, because, wow, his name alone means the Lord or God is salvation. That's what his name means. 
and he was a prophet during four of our kings. This is when Judah, Judah is is um, the what God and who God's dealing with. Um, the ten northern tribes have gone off into captivity. So he is a prophet during Uzziah, Yothan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He's contemporary with Amos, that's Amos, Hosea, and with Micha, Micah. And here, contemporary with Micha tells us where he'd be born. Isaiah tells us how he'd be born. You keep putting this together, and the proof, it, it's literally astronomically impossible to put it into a mathematical figure, how prophecies prove Yeshua is Messiah is our Savior, is the one spoken of, and the authentic word of God that doesn't miss a mark. His favorite title for God is the Holy One of Israel. I thought about Thomas singing, you know, leading us in the mighty God of Israel recently. Very close. The Holy One of Israel, 25 times in the book of Isaiah. I think that's his favorite title for him. And he puts God in a league of his own. He makes it clear, only God is worthy of our worship, worthy of our adoration. He he does, he covers everything. I love that one of my sources, when I was studying his background, said he had the courage of a Daniel. He had the sensitivity of a Jeremiah and the pathos, the, the passion of a Hosea. I think that fits him. I liked that. And in the first chapter, unfortunately, he's calling the nation, not unfortunately, this part, he is calling the nation to repentance. Unfortunately, he's warning them. He's predicting the destruction of the first temple. He's uh, warning them of the siege of Jerusalem. He's warning them just as Assyria carried off the ten northern tribes, they are looking at being carried off by Babylon, who is now the head. Babylon has swallowed up Assyria. Babylon's moving in the direction that Yeshayahu can see the warning. Uzziah being the king at, the, at this point in time, because remember his, Isaiah's prophecies cover four kings. When Uzziah was king, he was so proud in his royalty that he felt he was above the law. He thought he could violate God's holiness and he could thrive. And I'll tell you, he not only couldn't thrive, he couldn't even survive. And in Second Chronicles, when we read, which gives us the backgrounds and the stories that fill in for our kings, chapter 26, and if you read verses 16 and 19 on your own later, you will see that God was so displeased with Uzziah, who was not respecting God's holiness at all, that he uh, suddenly struck him with leprosy. And he had leprosy until the day of his death. When they had leprosy, they had to immediately be isolated. They were not with others. He spent his last days alone and away from his position of power and where he thought he was something. He really, he got his comeuppance and he found out he wasn't all that and something too. But Isaiah was using it to help Israel see that's your condition. You're violating the holiness of God. And the very way that God did not take it lightly with the king He's not going to take it lightly with Israel. Her condition is not good. I'm going to pick up my tablet. And if you read in the beginning, the first chapter in Isaiah, chapter 1, and I'm going to focus particularly on verse 4. Whoops. Okay. I try to hurry, and it's drawing all by itself. There we go. Got it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, oh, and tell me I didn't put it in, and I didn't put it in. Okay, let me call up real quickly Isaiah chapter 1. I missed one of my, when I set my tablet in order. Sorry, I try to have them down and ready so I can hurry because of time. Uh, chapter 1 of verse 4 says, Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly, they've abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They turned away from him. That was the condition of the nation. This is who Yeshua, Isaiah, was trying to awaken them. Look at your sin. Turn from your sin. Teshuvah, turn, repent. He's trying to bring this out to them because he's seen the desperateness of the situation and what's about to happen. But at the same time, he would constantly tell them when he would be 
judging them harshly, but there's hope. There's hope. There's hope. I think this is a message we need to take to our Israel today. They are not in line with God's holiness. They are violating God's holiness to this day. They are not keeping his word. They're not trying to follow him and please him. And we need to call it out, but not in a judgment that says that's it, it's over. Not in a judgment like those in replacement theology who say God's done with Israel. No, we need to bring them the full truth of the word of God. There is hope. There is hope. There is a reason to hope. And as I go on, I trust you will see that. Proverbs 29 and verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Or the, the people perish is one uh, translation. The idea that if you don't have a hope is so discouraging. You lose all hope. You do. In the essence, you perish. And then it says, But happy is the one who keeps the law. Here's your contrast. Happy is the one who is right with God. And the flip side of this is how the world looks at it. Eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow you'll die. So let's go party, let's party hardy. I've heard you only go around once, taking as much fun as you can, do it all, try it all, hang it all, go. How sad that is, because where is the hope in that? What is the end? What do they have to look forward to? Well, Yeshia, I'm jealous. He's going to be given a grand vision. Oh, my goodness, a vision of the Lord himself. And you can read it for yourself in Chapter 6 in particular. I will come back to it and talk about it. But this, this is the heart of his message, is to present this Lord in his glory who wants to have relationship with his people, to bring them this hope. And so Yeshua is going to identify the one that is their hope, the hope of Israel, is their Messiah, is their Savior. And he will identify him in chapter 9 and verse 6. We'll come back, back to that, I think, in a moment. Maybe, maybe I better read it now. I probably will refer to it later, but if I've read it once, then... Uh, and where we can remember it. And it's very familiar, but I want you to hear it, thinking of it from Yeshua's viewpoint, and not from our thoughts in a month called December in the Gregorian calendar, because there's a whole lot more meaning to this than just that. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders. He's going to be ruler. Okay, this one's going to be ruler, and he's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Shalom, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of the peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on, and Janet's favorite word, even if she's not here, forevermore. The zeal of the, the Lord of the armies, the zeal of Adonai Zavaot, will accomplish this. Wow. What did he just tell the nation? Someone is coming. A child's going to be born, but a son is going to be given. Because remember, the son of God is not born. The son of God always existed. He's very God himself. And Proverbs 30 and verse 4 talks about who God is. Asks several questions, and the answer to each one is... It's God, it's God, it's God. And then it says, and what is his son's name, if you can name it? Our scriptures tell us, Tehillim, Psalm chapter 2, and many other places tell us, God and God the Son both existed eternally. So he's promising that a child is going to be born. He's told the virgin birth uh, a couple chapters earlier, which is just a little earlier. And now he's focusing on the fact that this one who's coming is going to be ruler. This one who's coming, it, it, all these names that I gave you, I think it was just last year that we went through those in the month of December in their death. There's so much meaning there. I cannot stop and give it to you because it'll take the rest of my night and then some. I took a whole week on each name. So mm -hmm. see me later for that. But the, then he goes on into verse 7 after telling how wonderful he is in so many different ways and so much that it, it's just 
in the Hebrew and the Hebrew background what it's telling. Then he says there'll be his his government will it, it, it will not end. It will only get bigger. It'll only get better. It never ends, and it will be with justice and with righteousness that the rule goes out. Do we live in a just and a righteous world today? Does anyone feel like those who should be dealt with, you know, corrupted, pay their consequences? Does it happen? Or how many times do we hear sin gets away with it for a day? And how many good deeds are people rewarded for? God alone doesn't get rewarded for his good deeds. Remember I told this last week, and I hear it again. It's an act of God. Does that mean look at creation? Look at the beauty. Look at the wonder. That's what it should mean, but it doesn't, does it? It's tsunami and hurricane and tornado and all of these horrible experiences. Why doesn't God get blamed for what he has done? Why does he get blamed for what man looks at and thinks in this negative way? Yeshia is telling us how great this one is. This one that's promised, this one that's going to sit on David's throne forever. And again, in these two verses, all the way from birth to second coming, ruling as king, we see here. Why am I bringing you this now? Why am I tying this in? Because as we move on into the study for tonight, we are on a very special, a very significant Shabbat. Does anyone know the name of the Shabbat? It's Shabbat Chazam. And what it means, or what is also known as, is Black Shabbat. That's a lot to say because our Shabbat is supposed to always be looking at hope and looking at what's beautiful and remembering the God of our creation, the relationship he wants with us. So why do we have a black Shabbat? And it's meant for mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. It's meant for mourning because we're culminating, as I mentioned, sundown Wednesday will be Tisha Ba'av. Now, I think it was Janet mentioned earlier that we're in the month of Av. That's like we say we're in the month of July, okay? Av is the name of the month. Tisha means the ninth day of that month. That is the saddest day on the entire Jewish calendar for the entire year. And not for this year, that's through our history. There is so much that has happened on that day that we do commemorate it, that we do remember it. And specifically, it started with the destruction of the first temple on the 9th of Av. Now, I'll tell you, our second temple was destroyed, different year by far, on the 9th of Av. And I'll take you in a bit through some history where it happened on the 9th of Av. So by this point, our rabbis take us to this time and some even started with the first day, as soon as we started this new month, for those nine days building up to Tisha B'Av, is even more serious to them than between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. They're mourning, they're crying out, we need to repent, we need to ask God's forgiveness, we need to turn to Him so that our circumstances can change. Otherwise, there'll be more catastrophes that happen on the ninth of Av. So this is where they are at. They will not have any joy in their Shabbat, which is against the normal rule. During this period of time, I told you last week, they won't do anything. They won't have parties, and they won't even cut their hair. They won't. There's a lot they won't do. Some won't even bathe. They will keep themselves from being offensive, but they'll do that in the least way possible so that they can't take any joy in any kind of creature comfort. So they, it's just amazing how much they do, and they'll take in a time of fasting, usually on the 9th of Av. So you can see the similarity to Yom Kippur, that this is what's in their mind, and they're, they're feeling the need, obviously, to get it right with God. They know we're not, uh, as a whole, as a people, we're not. Now, it's not coincidental 
that at the same time on this Shabbat, we're reading from Davarim, from Deuteronomy, the beginning of uh, the first three chapters, I believe it is. This portion of Deuteronomy speaks to 40 years of wandering. It tells it. It tells it that they wandered because of their sin of unbelief. It tells about the consequences. It tells about being exiled and about destruction. So it sounds very much like it fits right with Isaiah and right with Jeremiah and right with how they're prophesying. But it also gave hope. It also brings us right to the hope of Israel's vision, of Isaiah, I'm sorry, of Isaiah's vision, because it also tells about the victories that it didn't all go down in defeat. It wasn't over. The people of Israel were not cast out forever, and that they would go into the promised land. So at the same time, we have the hope that is there, and we do read these two portions of Scripture always on Shabbat Chazam. We always look at the destruction, and we look at the um, sin of unbelief and the consequences, but we look at the hope. We look at the victory, and we see the other also. Isaiah was so discouraged, he was crying out and asking God, how long will the people be hard-hearted? How long will they not be able to turn back to God for their healing? And God speaks to them, and he tells them in chapter 11 and verse 1 that there would be a stump come out of Yeshua. That that's a, a, like a stump, an olive tree cut down, there would be a shoot that would come up. And that was the messianic hope. That's the picture of our Messiah who would be cut off but resurrect, who would come back from the, the death and who would be our Savior. This is even what the rabbis say it speaks of. There are even rabbis on record who will admit it speaks of Messiah. What they won't admit is it speaks of Yeshua. But they've got it half right. We just need to pray that their eyes be open and they see and they understand. But prior to Yeshua giving this great prophecy of the shoot that comes from the line of, of Yeshi, by the way, which is the line of David, and I had to stop and ask myself, why did it give the name Jesse and not David? Because usually, you know, it's all in relation with Melch David, with King David, but it's his father's name. Ah, God the Father telling us the Son is going to rise in resurrection. I think there's our reason why. So prior to this time, though, in chapter 6, Yeshai gets this vision. He sees the glory, the Shekhinah glory of the Lord. That's where I tell you, I want to see the Shekhinah glory. I have an imagination. I can tell you in my imagination what I've seen. I can tell you experiences that I've had with the Lord that are Amazing. I do not belittle them. But Yeshua saw the Lord in his robe of glory. It was so beautiful. He could hardly take it in. And all he can tell us is about the train of the Lord's robe. Anyone know what the train is? Very good. Think of the wedding gown. The part that hangs behind, that drags on the ground, that's the train. They've got all of this and all of this glory. That's just the tail end. That tail end filled the entire temple with the glory of the Lord. Can you imagine? that A bigger space than we're looking at here just shining with the glory of the Lord. And that's where Isaiah just passed in it. And then I think that the, the one human thing any of us would do Oh, woe is me. I'm filthy. You know, the closer we get to God, the we realize our own filthiness. And that's where he just, whoa, I've got unclean lips. And God sends an angel to touch his lips so that he could feel that God was bringing him purity, was purifying him. And Yeshua's heart in all of this is what you hear. When God is saying, who will go with for me? Who will tell the people? And he just cries out, Yenani, Yenani, you're my uncle, Lord, uncle, Lord. And I just, oh, I can, wow. Wow. Just let me have a moment of that, Lord. <laughs> In the midst of a sin-soaked nation, 
and for us in the middle of a sin-soaked world. To grasp, to have that beauty, to see for a moment the glory of the Lord. It's going to wash away all this evil one day. And he will set up that kingdom. Israel's hope will rise, and she will see. But right now, it's our place to say, Hineni, I'll go, Lord. I'll tell them so they can hear and be a part, too. Because right now, they're not seeing his glory. Right now, they are mourning. Right now, is headed for Tisha B'Av. They're reducing their joy in every way they can. No luxuries. Some won't even wash clothes. They, I imagine they get them washed before so they have enough to wear, but they won't even wash clothes. I've already told you some of the other things. They're practicing mourning. It is so solemn. It is so sad. And it's so without hope because they're hoping for it, but they can't see it. This is where they need Isaiah's vision. This is where they need to see if we do teshuva, if we do repent, God is there. And he does bring us the hope of our salvation. There's a parable they tell at this season. There's a, a rabbi, and this is in the Hasidic, the ultra-Orthodox um, tradition, Rabbi Baruch by name. Now, whether it's a true story or not, I'm told it's a parable that to me means it wasn't a true story, but he used his son for the example. So whichever way, he tells the story that he found his young son crying. And so he went to him, he asked him, why are you crying? What's wrong? And the boy replied to him, well, my friends and I were playing. We were playing hide and seek. And it was my turn to hide. And so I went and I hid. And I hid, and I waited, and I waited. I was hiding for a long time. And suddenly I realized, they're not looking for me anymore. And so he was in tears. He felt rejected by his friends. They'd forgotten about him. And the rabbi said, ah, that's what we've done to God. God has told us that he's hid his face from us for a time. Why? Not because he's mad at us, but he wants us to seek him. And he tells us in the scriptures, seek for me. Seek for me with your whole heart, and you'll find me. And God wants us to search for him. He wants us, and he'll let us find him. But the rabbi said, sadly, we've forgotten, and we've left him in hiding. There's a lot to be said for that. And sadly, that's where my heart breaks, like Isaiah and like Jeremiah, for my people today. God is willing them to seek. And they need someone to help them find him. They need us. We need to tell. We need to not keep this to ourselves. This is the greatest gift. This is the best news. This pales in comparison to nothing on this earth. Everything else falls to the wayside, that our people are going about there every day and they're not realizing what they're missing. We've got to tell them. We've got to go. If you're comfortable sitting here and not going, there's something wrong. I'm just going to say it. This is a time for Shabbat Chazon to become a time of hope. I want to go to my Jewish people who are mourning, and I want to say, he rose, he came, he rose. His promise will be fulfilled. You'll see him come again, but you can have his joy now. Victory can be ours now. Just like we look at Dalvarim and we see that the victory came, Tisha B'Av, the saddest day, can turn to be a day of joy on the calendar. And that fits scripturally because we are even told, and I will read it to you, it's Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 19. Adonai Sabaot, the Lord of hosts says, the fast days of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months are to become times of joy, gladness, and cheer for the house of Judah. Therefore, love truth and shalom. And do you know what the ninth of August is? The fast of the fifth month. Right here in the scripture, God says, 
Tisha B'Av, your sad and mournful day is to turn to a day of joy. How do you turn mourning for a temple destroyed, a second temple destroyed, and so much more? How is that going to turn to joy? Well, stay tuned. Let me tell you also in telling 30, Psalm chapter 30 and verse 5, we read, For his anger is momentary, his favor lasts for a lifetime. Tears may linger for the night, but with dawn come cries of joy. And you know that song was the song they used in the dedication of the temple? Did they realize what they were saying? How prophetic. Back in Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 3, beauty for ashes. That we have the, the garland of joy instead of the mourning that they were, they were enduring. Telling Psalm 30 and verse 11 says, You turned my mourning into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and you clothed me with joy. Remember, the Lord is wearing a beautiful gown. And we know when we come into Him by faith, he puts his robe of righteousness on us. Do you realize we're going to glow? <laughs> Ooh, what heaven looks like. <laughs> Maimonides, he explained, he said, you know, the purpose of fasting isn't to remember the suffering. It isn't to remember, like, the days of joy and days of sorrow. It's to awaken our hearts and to clear the path to repentance. And I think, okay, then mourn that way. Open your heart. Find that path to repentance because he is right in repentance. Joy comes in the morning. It's not to remind of evil deeds, but it's to recall to mind what was done wrong that we might do what's right. So if it was wrong for our people in the past to do it their own way, to turn from the Lord, to not follow the word of God and his laws, that suffered destruction then what's the word for people today? You want hope? You want to come into this joy? You want to know that your future is bright? Turn toward the Lord. Not away. Turn to Him. Remember, He hid so you'd seek for Him. So you'd look for Him. And He promises you will find Him. When we look at this day, I can tell you that this is the day that God said, this generation will not go into the promised land. And he was talking about the generation that listened to 12 spies. Ten of them said, oh, we can't do this. There are giants in there. We're afraid. And two said, we'll eat them up. They'll just be bread for us. Oh, they'd only listen to the two. That is, the crowd will often do. They'll go with a the majority. They'll go with the crowd mentality. And they chose the way of the spies. And so God said, okay, you won't believe. You won't receive. On this day, the 9th of Av. I've already told you that two temples were destroyed on the 9th of Av. Why does the temple destruction so disturb the heart of the Jew that he remembers it hundreds of years later? Why does this matter? Let me give you a little description of that temple. For 830 years, there stood an edifice, a temple, upon a Jerusalem hilltop. It served as a point of contact between heaven and earth. So central was the edifice to the relationship between man and God that nearly two-thirds of our mitzvot, our commandments to do good, are contingent upon its existence. Its destruction is regarded as the greatest tragedy of our history, and its rebuilding will mark the ultimate redemption, the restoration of the harmony within God's creation and between God and his creation. If you're not understanding it, remember, go back to the tabernacle. That's where they knew God would meet with them, and they would meet with God, and they saw the Shekinah glory. Then the tabernacle became permanent instead of moving, and it was called the temple. This was where God would meet them. When it was destroyed, they went off into captivity. Where was God? They didn't know where he was. They could have known because he was not where they could not find him. But until they finally turned their hearts back and were willing to do it God's way. The second temple being destroyed, we have the same issue. 
and sadly they are looking for a third temple they're mourning for it right now and I say sadly because that third temple is going to come but it's not the temple that Yeshia saw that temple is going to come during a very troublous time for our nation of Israel and it's going to be they think their euphoria they've got it back they've got where they can meet with God and it's going to meet with one who puts an image of himself in there and demands worship the one called the Antichrist and he's going to destroy the beauty of the temple it will be as, as, uh, as what Antiochus Epiphanes did to the, to the temple he will do and worse this is not Yeshua's temple that they are mourning because they don't have a place to meet God and they're missing and they're, they're misunderstanding so much happened let me take you through real quickly and then I'll come back to this point here because this is our focal point it's, it really is all about the temple during this week it's also believed not only for the things I've told you but in 135 AD that's when the last holdouts of the second Jewish revolt against Rome when a hundred thousand Jews were slaughtered and this was the Bar Kokhba rebellion and this was the final they had been Jerusalem had been besieged, the temple had been burned down, the, 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 if you were in Jerusalem as a Jew, you were a dead Jew. And they thought that they you know, were getting them everywhere, and they thought when they got this 100,000 more that had run, that were caught, that, that uh, and that's bad history, I'm telling you too fast, but anyway, that's what they thought is over. 136 AD, Yerushalayim completely destroyed, declared so on 9th of Av. The death of Aharon, our first high priest in Bamidbar Bar in Numbers 33 and verse 38 tells us it was the first day of the fifth month. There's your first of Av. And that's why they'll go from the first to the ninth, from Aaron's death to the temple death and remember that time period. They were sent into exile at this time because they didn't, the, the, the 10 spies report was accepted and not God's word. Jumping quickly to history, to closer to today, in 1290 AD, all the Jews were expelled from England on this date. In 1391, 4,000 Jews were killed in Toledo and in Spain. In 1492, does that sound familiar to anybody? Mm -hmm. Is that a year that you were taught when you were maybe seven in school? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in 1492, the Jews were expelled from Spain. Okay. And if you don't know some of the history, Christopher Columbus had Jewish mappers on his ship, and he sat Shiva on the 9th of Av, which means mourned for the temple before he set sail. Very interesting. 1559, the Jewish quarter in Prague was burned and looted. 1914, Jewish people were attacked in Eastern Russia and World War I was declared. And some believe that the results of that's what led to the Holocaust. 1942, Warsaw, the first massive deportations from the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka. 1944, Kovno Ghetto liquidated. 1970, a little closer to us and after the Holocaust, Libya confiscated all Jewish property in their country. Sad history and amazing the date. Why? I don't know. But it makes our people think. Yeshaya also spoke of something Jeremiah spoke about. And I brought it out last week with Jeremiah. He spoke about the French. In chapter 6 and Jeremiah 23 and 33 and Zechariah 6, all of these speak of this branch. I already told you about the shoot that shoots up out of the stump, the branch, another name for it. This branch comes, according to Zechariah, Zechariah 6, 12, and 13, and this branch fills the role of priest and fills the civil role of government authority. There's shalom found between the two, and it says that it fills the whole temple of the Lord. The temple Lord is filled with the glory of the Lord. Israel will be head nation, and the people will know that their Messiah is keeping the promises of Yeshua, of Yemiah, of Zechariah, of so many others. 
Uzziah thought he could be the one. And we see where his end came. The Lord is the only one who belongs on that throne. And he's the only one who will rule and reign. And so on this Shabbat, when they're looking toward the third temple and studying about Yeshua, looking at the glory of the Lord fulfilling the temple, they realize and they say, that's what will bring back redemption. That's what, we'll, what we need. So they even say, we need to rebuild the temple so that Messiah can come. It doesn't go in that way, but that's what they think. And that's why there's the Temple Mount faithful that have done so much to be ready. They're, they're just waiting to be allowed to build their temple. They have the cornerstone. They try to lay it. It causes war. They get pulled back. They have all of the, the what do I call it, paraphernalia that's used in temple worship. It's all ready. It's in their institute. It's not museum pieces. It's not made to scale. These are actual, what they will take, literally they will empty their, their institute and put everything in the temple. The day they have it, boom, they are ready to, to be doing everything the temple is supposed to do. They think that's going to bring them this joy. And they'll have joy for a moment. <laughs> But they're going to, as I say, go through this time when the Antichrist puts the image of himself and says, bow down to me. And they're going to find themselves not having the redemption that they thought that was going to get for them because they're going to go back to the animal sacrifices. But the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world forever is the only sacrifice that satisfies a holy God. And yet, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11, Isaiah 6 told them, God has a plan for them, a future and a hope. Hezekiel takes eight chapters from 40 to 48 and describes a beautiful temple, a huge temple. And guess what? That's Isaiah's temple. That's the one that the glory of the Lord is going to fill the whole temple. I can hardly wait to see that in its reality. That is Israel's hope. That is Israel's Future. That is why to them the temple is so important because there's the yearning among the religious. We've got to get right with our God. We've got to do teshuva. We've got to repent. We've got to figure out how. And that's the sad part. They're trying to do it in their strength. We'll substitute because we can't do this. We'll substitute. Well, where does God say in the scriptures you can substitute? Nowhere. And I will say, has God condemned the Jews since 70 AD because they can't make those animal sacrifices? And we know the answer is no, because the permanent sacrifice, the Lamb of God, put his blood on the heavenly ark, the uh, yeah, ark of the covenant. He put it on the mercy seat for us. That's where their attention needs to be drawn. It's completed. And the temple right now, we see it beautifully in heaven because what was on earth was patterned after the heavenly. That is Israel's hope. That is what will come down and will fill the, the hilltop again. And the nations will come up and worship Messiah on his throne. What is Israel's hope? Messiah. In one word, Messiah. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. I heard the voice of Adonai saying, Whom should I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah spoke, said, I'm here. Send me. Hineni. And God's answer was, Go and tell the people. I encourage you, go and tell the people. Don't be afraid. Oh, I can't talk. What am I going to say? I'm too young. I don't know enough scripture. I, who me? If God could put the words in your man's mouth, if he could touch Isaiah and make his mouth clean, can he not take care of every fear and every excuse you have? And I'm going to give you no room for any excuse. Go and tell. Because it's not you, it's the, the spirit of God in you who will bring the words, who will share it with those who need to hear. 
oh, how I want my people to know, yes, you have a hope. Your hope is coming, but he's been here once before. Let me tell you, let me take you on a walk through our prophecies, and let me show you. However God does it, he'll do it in a different way with every person because he meets them where they are. And he says, all I want out of you is your availability. I didn't say, here's the criteria. Get out your checklist, see if you measure up. I just said, who will go for me? And he'll do the rest. So go. Tell my people, Israel's hope, Messiah. Can I introduce you to my best friend? Let's close up. Lord God of Israel, mighty God of Israel, I love Isaiah's names for you also. We see you high and lifted up. We see the glory in our mind's eye. We praise and we look forward to that day. That Lord, let us not be comfortable sitting. Let us not be comfortable with our feet not moving. Send us out, Lord. Send us out. Let us do it not in fear and trembling because you have promised you, you will put your words in our mouths. You will do it. It is your spirit, your real Chakodesh within us. It is not we ourselves. So let us go out with confidence. Let us find one this week, Lord, to share the greatest story ever told. Messiah has come. He will rule. He will come again in that ruling. But he's come as the child that was born and the son that was given. Lord, open their eyes to hear, to see, their ears to hear, and let the word sink in that one more might join us in the glory of your temple one day. Praise you, thank you, hallelujah, what an amazing God. Ah, we praise you all the day long. In your holy name, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Okay.
Shalom. 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 I gotta go get food out. Lots of goodies. Come and enjoy, but give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> 